John chapter 19, beginning in verse 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. Let's pray together. Lord, we are humbled by the majesty of what's revealed in your word. Lord, we recognize that we don't have the capabilities in and of ourselves to to learn what you want us to learn. So we ask that you, your Holy Spirit would teach us and instruct us, bring application as only he can. We know, Lord, that your word is alive. It's sharper than any two-edged sword. We know it'll accomplish every purpose it's sent to accomplish. Jesus, you said uh, that your words are spirit and they are life, Lord. And so we can't think of any better thing to turn to than your word this morning uh, for to fashion us, to mold us, to further conform us to the image of Jesus. We're so grateful, Lord, that you want to do that in us more than we want you to do it. So we commit it to you. We pray that you'd set this time aside for your holy use. And we commit it to you in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. We are steadily making our way through the seven statements from the cross. And I want to read those for you Uh, again. Hopefully that we'll get these ingrained in us. The first one is, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. Assuredly, I say to you today, you'll be with me in paradise. Woman, behold your son, behold your mother. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? I thirst. It is finished. And Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. So we covered the first two statements thus far. The first statement focused on Jesus' unfathomable, just beyond comprehension, forgiveness. The capacity for God to forgive left us breathless, left us speechless, left us in awe of him that the Father would be... Would be um, he's asking the Father if the Father would forgive these Romans... And he says it repeatedly. We saw this in the verbs there, in the, in the original language, that he did this repeatedly. Uh, and he, you know, and I wonder, I've thought about this, you know, when, did it, how, when did he do that? When did he say those things? When did he, how often, what, the time, what was the timing? Was it after the, when an, each nail was, was put in place? Did he say it? Did he say it with each stru- after each strike of the hammer into the nail as the pounding the nails in? Did he? I mean, I don't know. Just you think about the fact that he's he has this massive, huge heart, supernatural heart that w- wants to forgive these Romans because they were they were soldiers were ignorant. They really didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know uh, anything that was happening. They were doing their job. They went to to work that day and did their job, and so. Um, we saw this great, great extension of God's forgiveness there, and it was it, it was it was breathtaking. It was it was amazing to see that, and it spoke to us regarding being looking to Jesus as our example of forgiving and being and not holding things against people. When we receive Jesus, we forgive his forg- when we receive his forgiveness. We re- we relinquish the right to not forgive. Like part of receiving forgiveness for G- from Jesus is extending it to others. And so that can be hard. There's all kinds of circumstances, but we don't have an option. Jesus made it very clear in other places that that's what he has for the believer is, is to um, forgive. The second statement we looked at is that, um, that Jesus, he, he said, he, he talked about this, this great salvation for this thief. We saw it last week. Both thieves were hurling insults at the beginning of that time that Jesus was on the cross from 9 a.m. to 3 p.m. And eventually this thief, most likely by watching the Lord Jesus say these things from the cross to to ask the Father to forgive, and, and also how Jesus handled the whole situation, to see like God in human flesh, you know, to, uh, you know, to, to, to extend that grace. So you could say the first statement is, is a, it's the theme of forgiveness. The second statement is the theme of grace. And, and it's a beautiful thing. And so um, 
here we're going to see Jesus provide for his mother Mary. So you could say the word that, that sums up this account and this statement is provision. Jesus makes provision for Mary. And remember, all these things, it's coming from a heart that, that is breaking, that is, that is suffering, that is going through intense agony. And all these things that so far that we've seen have been about others. It's just, it, we can read it that so often and we can get so familiar with it, we can lose sight of the fact that he's not thinking of himself. He's thinking of others this whole time. And, it's, and he's showing that love and that concern for others in different ways. And we get to, when we look at all, you no, know, seven is the number of perfection in the scriptures or the number of completion. And so these are the recorded, the seven recorded statements from the cross. He said more than that on the cross, but these are the recorded uh, things that we see. And so he provides for his mother. Now, if you have a Roman Catholic background, like I do, I went, I went to, uh, I was dragged kicking and screaming uh, to church uh, every, every week for, for, for years. And when I became 13, I think my, my mom wasn't interested in going. She was just going to fulfill a promise she made to my dad before he died that she would take us to church. Um, and so when I was 13, I think she thought I was old enough to to be a man or whatever, and I could make my own decision. So that was it for me. So I, but I'm, but I had a foundation though of, of, of I, ne- I never remember a time of not believing in God. I never, I, I learned about, I learned about that he died on a cross. I learned about sin. I learned about heaven and hell and all these things. I just didn't understand about a personal relationship with him, and didn't know how to appropriate that relationship. But, but, but as you know, they take Mary. The, the, her person, her ministry, all these things that they talk about way too far in my view, in the biblical view. But we know that. I think all of us are pretty, pretty um, you know, familiar with that. But what we don't often think about is, as we would say, Protestants, you know, non-Catholic Christians, we would say that that doesn't mean that we, I think, go too far the other direction sometimes. I and mean, I don't think we talk enough about Mary and, and, and how amazing those, the scriptures reveal that she was and how favored she was. Mary was an amazing and blessed woman. The angel told her in Luke chapter 1, verse 28, Rejoice, highly favored one. The Lord is with you. Blessed are you among women. He told her to rejoice and that she was favored, that the Lord was with her, and that she was blessed among women. But he didn't say you're blessed above women. He said, you're blessed among women. You're one, of, you're, one, you're one among equals, and you're blessed and all of that. So we can take that so far. I mean, some of that teaching gets so crazy, like, like he, she died with him on the cross, or she ascended into heaven with him. Um, you know, she was on, she was in, she's in Acts chapter 1, verse 14. It, she's at the day that, you know, in the upper room, <laughs> praying to be baptized with the Holy Spirit. She couldn't have ascended. I mean, there's all kinds of things that we see. Also, it's revealed in, in Luke chapter 1, verse 46 and 47, when, when she was with Elizabeth, she said, My soul magnifies the Lord, and my spirit has rejoiced in God my Savior. That's your scripture to demonstrate she needs a Savior just as much as anybody else. Now, obviously, there's, there's a lot more things there that you could dissect and look at, and it was, it was amazing. And I mean, that whole thing, account there of her visiting Elizabeth and John the baptizer is jumping in Elizabeth's womb when Mary greets her most likely she said shalom and when you know that the baby jumped which has a it's a great that's also a great text for um what the scriptures reveal t- t- speaking of you know that a baby is a baby before it's born so that that's God's perspective on things and and he reveals that so um perfectly but Jesus seemed to know. I don't know if you've noticed this or you've studied these verses, but it seemed, I mean, obviously he knew he's God in human flesh, but he said things anticipating people looking too much at her. Um, and, and we're told in Luke chapter 11, verse 27 and 28, and it happened as he spoke these things that a certain woman from the crowd raised her voice and said to him, blessed is the womb that bore you and the breast which nursed you. But he said, more than that, blessed are those who hear the word of God and keep it. 
So he's trying to de-emphasize uh, a, a, a attitude or, a, or a, uh, uh, an outlook that would lift her up more highly than she ought to be lifted up for sure. And, and, and it seems like he's, he's, he knew that that was going to be the case by what he said, of course. But he, Jesus never exalted her. Jesus never told us to pray to her. He never put the focus on her. You know, she's not listed as many others in the New Testament. In, the, in, in um, Hebrews chapter 11, like there's no instruction regarding having her as an intermediary or a mediator. In fact, in 1 Timothy, it says there's one mediator between man and God, the man Christ, or God and man, the man Christ Jesus. If that scripture's true, then that means that there's no, that the church can't be an, a mediator, a priest can't be a mediator, uh, the, a saint can't be, um, I mean, all Christians are saints, but in terms of how they define it, can't be a mediator. Um, I could go on and on and on. Mary can't be a mediator. No, there's only one mediator, and, and, and that is what, how, what God says, and that's one of the reasons why I believe you, we see that temple curtain be r- ripped from top to bottom and what that was doing on that day, those, all those religious leaders, we went through the trials. We went through the trial of the, him, him before the Sanhedrin. They're all there thinking they were in control. They all thought that they were controlling the, the narrative or what was happening. But when he died on that cross, that temple curtain was, that was like 15 or 20 feet higher, super high, super thick, ripped from top to bottom. On that day, the priesthood ended. It ended. You know, it kept going in perpetuity all the way till they destroyed the, the, um, the temple in AD 70. But as far as God was concerned, the priesthood, sacrifices, all that ended because the Lord Jesus died once and for all. And if you read the book of Hebrews, you understand that that sin, was, that, that sin offering and that payment was once and for all. Uh, and it's a, it's a beautiful um, reality. And I think about Mary and I think about her experiences, what, it, what must have been like to... I mean, she had experiences no one else had with, with, with the Messiah, with the God in human flesh. And, and, and just think about what it would be like to raise him. Remember, he's never, he never sinned. So my first question would be, was there terrible twos? <laughs> I mean, terrible twos, I mean, I've been th- through that a couple times personally. Terrible twos, the number one goal, I just remember saying this to Sandy, the number one goal is they don't get what they want. That's all that matters in this world. They don't get what they want. Um, I mean, food and water, okay, yeah, we'll let it slide. But, um, you know, uh, but the, what is the terrible twos? It's them being selfish. It's them being self-consumed. So I, I would, I'd be highly surprised if he had any kind of terrible twos. Um, he was sinless. So if that what didn't happen, he was just this nice little boy all the whole time and didn't, wasn't selfish ever, was thinking about others. I mean, well, she experienced that. She knows the answer to that. We can, when we go to heaven, we talk to Mary. We can ask her these questions. I'd hate to be siblings, you know. He had four brothers. He had four brothers and two, at least two sisters. So how would you like that? You know, I mean, you don't even have to say, what well, can't you be more like Jesus? It's just obvious that you've never seen Jesus do anything wrong, you know, and like talk about insecurity there. But, uh, you know, that would be tough. That'd be tough. May, you know, but it's funny that when you look at the scriptures, and we'll talk a little bit about it more later, is that they didn't believe. His brothers, he doesn't talk about his sisters, but his brothers, when you, we see him in the scriptures, they're skeptical. They're kind of playing games with him. They're kind of patronizing him. We saw it when we went through the book of John earlier. They didn't really believe. James, who wrote the book of James, his half-brother, he, it, Paul reveals that he first appeared to him. And, you know, I mean, beyond, I'm saying beyond Mary Magdalene and all that. I'm talking about beyond the, the first morning there. And so um, this, 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 she saw this perfect child. She, she saw this child grow up, and you know, they lost him at one of the feasts. They were like a day and a half ahead. They thought he was with relatives or whatever. He, they come back and he's in the temple. And so she knew, obviously, something was different. And we don't know the extent to which she knew what she knew, but she knew a lot. She knew what happened on the day of his, on, uh, on, on, uh, you know, the angel that appeared to her, all these things that happened. And, and so I believe she knew, she knew just about everything that was to come. I don't think that she was surprised by any of this happening, but it didn't make it any easier. 
So, so I, I, bet she, I, I wonder though, lastly before we move on, I, I wonder if she ever li- laid in bed and said about the other kids with Joseph, you know, why can't they all be like the first one? Because you know? the first one was like, oh, this is what kids are like. Having kids are like, that's pretty, pretty good. You know, and then all of a sudden the second one comes like, whoa, that's a big drop off. That's like, that's like me when I went to high school. My sisters, my two older sisters were very good students. I mean, really good students. And I remember just sitting in that class and I'm just shaking my head no before they even ask me, you know, like, are you, are you like your sisters? Like, no, I'm the polar opposite of my sisters, unfortunately. Um, so interesting to see, think about the things that she went through. Now we're introduced to these four who were at the cross with John in verse 25. Look with me in verse 25. Now there stood by the cross of Jesus, his mother and his mother's sister, Mary, the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. So first we have Mary, Jesus' mother there, and um, it says also his mother's sister. Now, most people believe this is Salome. This is James and John's mother, which they were sisters. And and so that's why you may have heard people talk about that Jesus and uh, James and John were cousins there. So we see that in other places. You can piece that together in your own study. But this would be this would be Zebedee's wife there. And so um, she's there. And then John it says, um, uh, it's, but John doesn't say, my mom was there. That's what you would expect. Hey, my mom was there. That's what I would say. But it's like slightly better, you know, more formal, better than I would write. Aren't you glad I wasn't writing scripture? Uh, but, but, you know, hey, my mom was there. But what, that, wasn't, that wasn't what he was about. He wasn't putting focus on himself. We see that clearly later when he won't even say his name. Um, doesn't even mention him in, in, this, in this verse 25. He's there, but he doesn't even mention himself. So he's not wanting to put the focus on himself, which is totally you would expect if you're being inspired by the Holy Spirit. Um, then it's, we're told Mary, the wife of Clopas. And then there's a little bit of debate regarding who this Mary is. There's, there's so many Marys, so little time. You know, they just to get them all, uh, you get them all confused, you know, it's hard for us to, to, to get them clear in our minds. But this is likely the mother of, so there are two Jameses in the, the apostles. There were James, John's brother, and then there was James, he's mostly called uh, James the Less or James the Younger. So most people believe that she's his mother uh, there. And so she's, and sometimes she's referred to as the other Mary. How would you like to do that? You're in the scriptures and you're called the other Mary. Oh, that's great. I'm with her. You ever remember those? Remember those? Or I'm with him. Remember those those shirts that said I'm with him, and it's just pointing next to you. You can you can stand next to anyone that you want. Okay, that was that was my bad childhood. I won't take you to it. But but it's like the other Mary. I mean, it's not really talking. It doesn't really give her name in every place that maybe she might prefer. Now Matthew and Mark tell us that these women. He names them. They name them too. But when, when Matthew and Mark describe them, he describes them as afar off. So only John records this, uh, this account. So remember, this, there's, there's, like, there's many years in between the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and John. John came much later. So John had time to pray. He had time to ask God you know, what, what he wants in there, of course, and, and think about it and all of that. And then who knows how many of those things that he desired He's, God still said, no, I don't want that in there, but I want this in there. This is one of the things that he, the Lord wanted to have him put in there, uh, is this account. So it says they were, they were from afar. Uh, and then so now in John, they've come closer. Now they're really close because uh, it, it, it reveals that. And we'll get into that in a second. So he's really close. They're really close there. And, and then the last person they mention is Mary Magdalene. Most of us Remember Mary, uh, who was uh, had seven demons exercised from her uh, and delivered, and and she was like a leader among the women. Um, again, there's there's no leadership position that that's given or that we see of Mary, Jesus' mother. Uh, there, it doesn't mean that it didn't exist, but I'm talking about what Scripture emphasizes. Usually, Mary is listed first, and Mary is um, kind of seen as the leader of the women. One thing of note, um, that, that one thing that gets passed over, if you think about it, is these women were brave. Can I get an amen for that? 
These women were brave. We're, the, the, the apostles aren't there, except John. Jesus said, we, you remember when we went through the upper room discourse there, and we, we, he, he talked about all of you will, will, will um, you know, desert me, forsake me. And they all did. John eventually did too. He went a little ways because he had familiarity with some of the, the people in the high priest's home. But he didn't go the whole way with Jesus. He didn't appear before the Sanhedrin. He didn't, I mean, there's all kinds of things. He, he, he eventually left. So they all did forsake him at, at one point. But here, the, the, the women, they go right to the cross. They're not, they're not ashamed. You know, sometimes people criticize Christianity thinking that we're oppressive to women and all that. Nothing could be further from the truth. Jesus liberated. He was the first liberator. You know, it was so bad back then that a woman's testimony wasn't even admissible in a court of law back then. And Jesus decided to appear first to a woman, Mary Magdalene, at the garden tomb. If you were making, first of all, you were making this stuff up, you wouldn't do that. Because that would, that would, you're just undercutting the validity of your, what you're writing because they would say, oh, he would ne- the Messiah would never appear to a woman. So there's all kinds. And you look at the, the, the Apostle Paul, especially in like Romans 16. If you read Romans 16, all the people he thanks personally, how many of them are women? You know, I, I just think it's, it's good to, to, to remind ourselves that women have a very, very important place in the body of Christ. And, and we need more men leading. You know, where, where I was kind of raised up in at Calvary Chapel Modesto, we had an abundance of men taking the lead. But traditionally, that's not normal in churches. Tr- traditionally, women are the ones that take the lead. And, and um, so I think that both should be taking the lead. I think there should be areas of service and people overseeing things and everything that is uh, re- well represented. Because uh, the body of Christ is beautiful when it functions how it's been made to function so that's kind of that's kind of this whole background of these people here and then you know what thing the thing about mary Jesus' mother is that she went through a lot of pain and suffering and sometimes we forget that she was a teenager when the angel appeared to her and told her she's going to have the messiah basically and 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 another angel uh spoke to joseph and he was going to put her away secretly. Like this was so scandalous. You know, today it's not scandalous. I wish it were more scandalous in the sense of the culture following the scriptures. But the, it was so bad. And she went through this stigma. And it was, uh, I mean, even we see it in the Gospels when, when the Pharisees say to Jesus, you know, we know, we know who our father is. You know, they, they put these little backhanded slaps in there to hurt and everything. And so she was known it's even in the Mishnah, it's in other Jewish writings about that she was in, uh, full of infidelity and it, it, she suffered in big time. Now, later at, at the dedication of Jesus, Simeon prophesied to her and literally said this. It said, a sword will pierce through your own soul also. A sword will pierce through your own soul also. So she knew from the very beginning if she was, I mean, I believe she was listening to the Lord through these vessels. And, and she would know that she was going to suffer greatly uh, as a result of it. You know, it's funny that, it, not funny, but it's, 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 uh, it's fitting that the word Mary meant bitterness. And, and so, obviously, she could choose to be bitter over these things, or she could choose to, to not be bitter and to trust the Lord. And that's really what she's known for, is trusting the Lord through her, through everything that happened, honoring him and trusting and having faith in him through the whole situation. Just imagine how much faith it would require to trust God. I mean, talk about as new parents, you feel uh, you're, you're, you don't measure up and you don't know what you're doing. You don't, you don't have any clue. You're not doing a good job. Think about raising the coming Messiah, how insecure you may be or feel like you don't really have your act together and you don't you're not doing a good enough job you're as best as you could do it's not worthy of what what god would be worthy of having you do and so she dealt with that but to see to be here now now this is the fear of every parent of losing a child right some of you have lost a child i haven't lost a child um but that's the fear of every parent of losing 
a child. So this goes above and beyond just losing a child, though. This is losing a child and losing the Messiah. Again, most people believed that this was a political, earthly Messiah, that they believed that this was you know, the, 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 the truth of what was going to happen. Now, I believe she believed, she knew that it was going to be, um, the resurrection was coming and it, it was more than just a political um, ministry that, that, that the Lord Jesus had. So, um, but again, we don't see Mary saying anything in this account. We don't really see her saying anything except in the very beginning. Um, and, and, and so, and I'm talking about in the gospel. So she's speechless here. She doesn't say anything that's recorded, at least where John's led to record what she says. And she's, she, Jesus is just a few feet away. Yet she's completely, he's completely out of reach to her. She obviously, I can't imagine what it'd be like to her to desire deeply to change this, to get, be able to just imagine her thinking, how can I get him off this cross? How can I, what can I do? But it was, it, nothing could be done. She was at the mercy of this wicked military and, and this, 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 all that's happened, knowing that he's sinless, knowing that he never did anything wrong, knowing that he always did the right thing. He loved people and he cared for people. So again, this, this would be so hurtful to her, her heart breaking to be able to watch this and see this. So yes, it's Friday, as we say, but it's Sunday's coming, you know, and there's going to be a resurrection. So Jesus, okay, so he's looking, he's on the cross, he's above them, he's looking down at them, they're very close, and he's looking down on all five of them there. And, and, and so he's, he's there, he's wanting to minister to them. He's not just thinking of himself, he's thinking of them. As we've seen, he's thinking about others. And then we're told in verse 26, when Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, he said to his mother, woman, behold your son. Now, I did mention this scripture when we were going through at the wedding of Cana, when he said, woman, it, on the surface, it can appear that he's being disrespectful, but this really means dear woman. This is not something that's disrespectful or anything like that. Uh, and he's saying, behold your son. And behold is in a form that's a command there. And behold means to carefully consider. Woman, behold your son. And, and again, this is John. Remember, we've talked about this as we've gone through the book. John's an old man. He's, he's in his 80s or 90s. It's been 30, 40 years since, since the last gospel has been written. He's remembering back by the Holy Spirit. I bet you he felt like he, he could see it. He could picture it. He knew what it looked like. I'm sure that image was branded in his mind and in his heart to see Jesus, you know, him, his vantage point of looking up and seeing Jesus and seeing him up on that cross and go through what he went through. Um, and so Jesus looks down. He sees his mother and the one whom Jesus loved. By the way, when John says the one whom Jesus loved, he's not saying that, that God loved, Jesus loved him more than anybody else. It's amazing how many people um, take that position. But he's, he's talking about his, his security in Jesus' love and how much it meant to him. Because obviously the Holy Spirit's not going to inspire him to say, Jesus loved me more. Because Jesus doesn't love anybody more than anybody else. He's no respecter of persons. He loved all of us equally. And so he, what he's stressing is that the blessing that it was to, for him personally to know that Jesus loved him and what that meant to him. That's why he's saying it. And plus, he also doesn't want to say his name, probably for humility's sake. But um, that's really what he's saying here. And, and so he says, behold, your son, you have a new son now. He will take care of you. And, and, and he says, um, John wrote there, whom he loves standing by. So he was standing right, right there next to Mary. And, 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 and so he says to her, behold your son. And then now he, he's going to say in verse 27, then he said to, to the disciple, behold your mother. And from that hour, that disciple took her to his own home. So he's saying, treat her like she's your mother. Now, in reality, that's his aunt. That's Aunt Mary to John. So he's already has a relationship, a family relationship with her. But um, he, now it's like it goes deeper than that. It's more than just your aunt. Now I want you to take care of her like she's your own mom. And, and, and he did. History records that. So he, he, you know, he took care of her. And then at some point, history records that she went with him to Ephesus uh, to 
the pastor of that church in Ephesus there. I think he pastored there a couple times. One in the Revelation in the island of Patmos and, and that um, persecution that happened uh, happened in between, I believe, his two, his two pastoral um, times there in, in Ephesus. But she went with him, and she probably didn't live long enough to see the second one. But the first one, uh, pretty confident that, that she got to experience that. So uh, one thing it doesn't say is it doesn't say, and from that hour the disciples worshipped her and prayed to her and as the mother of God. It doesn't say that. In fact, the end of that verse in verse 27 says that disciple took her to his own home. That's the, that's the, the consequential action of what Jesus did. It, it doesn't say, I'm telling you now that this is your mother and you need to pray to her and all these things. The, the result is he took her to his own home to take care of her. That's what it says there. That, that's, that's the reason why Jesus said what he said. Not for any other reason. She doesn't become our mother. None of that. Um, if you want to just look at scriptures, I mean, if you want to look at tradition and what people say, that's your choice. But if you want to look at what scripture says, that's the, that's the maximum that, that it says. And we have to look at everything accurately, no matter how we were raised. I mean, I was raised with all kinds of crazy teaching about stuff that I had to... Um, dispose of so um we want what scripture says we want what the the, the truth is uh there and but in reality there Mar- mary's greatest need honestly if you think about it G- mary's greatest need was for jesus to die and to raise to raise from the dead that's her greatest need she needed that just like we all do she needed that in her life way more than she needed jesus to remain alive as much as she would love to have that happen and everything she needed she needed him to die and to raise from the dead which he did so he cared for his mom even from a place of agony now we're told to be faithful to take care of our families in first timothy chapter 5 verse 8 we're told but if anyone does not provide for his own and especially for those of his own of his household he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever then we're also told in exodus chapter 20 verse 12 honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. So we're called to honor our father and, um, and mother. We're supposed to... Now, sometimes some of us have been hurt by our fathers and mothers. And they're not safe people. Uh, and so honoring them in that context may look a little bit different than if you had a healthy, functional home that you were raised in. All of us I mean, there's no perfect home, obviously, right? But, you know, to, some people have asked me in the past, and I've thought of it myself, you know, how do I honor my father and mother in this situation? And you just do what's best for them. You love them. Agape love means to do what's best for the other person, even at your own expense. That's what agape love means. So, godly agape love. Uh, so, for us, looking at whatever the situation is with our parents, we, if they're still alive, and they may not be trustworthy, but whatever is appropriate to do what's best for them, we need to do that, whether that's praying for them, whether that's giving them the space that they need, you know, because maybe we're tempted to be codependent or whatever and to, to do things for them that we shouldn't do. So we have to be um, sensitive to that. There's all these different situations. If you're blessed to have a parent that was healthy, um, obviously that's, it makes it easier. But we, all, we need to, it doesn't give conditions regarding honoring your father and mother and providing for your own family. Um, you know, I remember my mom died when I was 17 <clears throat> and, um, it was a, it was a big ordeal for me, uh, obviously. And I was in between my junior and senior year when she had, she had a heart attack and she went into a coma and then she died. Actually, it's like a few days away from 38 years, I believe. So, but I think back now and I think about, so she was just doing the best that she could. I mean, she wasn't a disciplinarian. That's partly explains my childhood and my crazy antics and all the crazy stuff that I did. But, but the, she was doing the best she could. I was the seventh one. She, had, she was a double widow, you know, and, and she, just wanted, she just wanted to make it <laughs> through, through my childhood just to survive, you know, because I was the most, I know this is hard for you to believe, that I was the most stubborn one in the family you're shocked, I know. Uh, but I was very, very stubborn, very, very hard-headed. And um, it took an encounter with the, the Lord, a supernatural one, to, to invade my life and to change me from the inside out. 
So, but I, I bring that up to say that I wish, in some ways, I wish there was a different plan because I would love to take care of her now. I would love to take care of her um, if that were needed. But we, all, we don't get those things always. And there's reasons why things happen the way they did. And God works all things together for good. And what man plans for evil, God meant for good. So God is sovereign over all those things. We can go back and wish things to be different. Um, but, you know, we can't, there's really nothing profitable in doing that. But I just love the fact that from agony, from a place of utter pain and agony, he's providing for his mom. He's already demonstrated a forgiving heart. He's already um, demonstrated a gracious heart. Now he's dem- demonstrating a providing heart. One last thing before I close here. Why not the brothers? That's the question I have. Why not the brothers? He had four brothers and two sisters, but they, they weren't probably in that society or culture able to provide like the, like the men were. Why didn't Jesus... Why did he choose John? And, and my question also is, were, were the brothers upset about it? Did the brothers hear about that? What do you mean? I don't know. It's interesting to find that out. But one of the things I've thought about and prayed about as I've considered this is that <clears throat> they weren't believers yet. So in part, I bet you Jesus is, knows that the, she doesn't need to go back to an unbelieving household where, the, where they're casting doubt on all this. Uh, of course, he knows that they're going to, at least James is going to receive him. But it, 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 there's a lot of possible reasons why that could have happened. Um, you know, this is Mary's nephew. John is Mary's nephew. And she, she already loved him. She already, he was in the family already. Another pers- a, a thing that I think is really important to think about is that they shared a lot that the brothers didn't because the brothers weren't believers yet. And so the, all that history with the Lord Jesus and all those experiences and all those things was important for John's development. Remember, John was a teenager when all this happened. He's in his 80s or 90s at this point, but he was a teenager. He was the youngest. I think he was the youngest of all the apostles. And, there, and so she would kind of, I mean, be a mother to him in a sense of kind of helping him grow up. I mean, you didn't even start your trade as a journeyman until you're 30 in that culture. That's why rabbis didn't start until they were 30. That's why Jesus started public ministry when he was 30, because that was the culture. So John had years left of development, and they had this shared knowledge of him and experience with him that the, the other brothers, the younger brothers, they were all younger than Jesus, didn't have. So it was perfect. It was an absolute perfect situation. Lastly, I be, the kind of the implication of this is that it helps us understand what God's priorities are and, is, and, and, and us be able to measure what, what's important, what's valuable related to f- blood family versus spiritual family. Because Jesus chose spiritual family, even though they, they were related, over a closer blood family. And, and sometimes we get put in those positions where we want to provide and we want to, to be faithful, and then we don't even realize it, and God places someone that is not even in our, we're not even related to in our lives very strategically, and we, sometimes we can feel guilty that we're neglecting our, our, our true blood family, but God is saying for us, at least for that season, this is who I've provided. I've provided this person in your life for a very specific reason. Don't resist it. I've, I've done it. And, and, and you're going you're gonna to have a mutual blessing relationship where you're going to be pouring into them, they're going to be pouring into you, and it's by design. You know, so, so often, and I don't know if you would raise your hand to this and agree, but I'm closer to my spiritual family way more than I am to my physical family. And, and sometimes, and we have to think about that, sometimes our, our spiritual family will outlive, that relationship will outlive, unfortunately, the, the relationship that we'll have with our with our blood family, because we don't, you know, if, if they don't receive the Lord, that's not going to go on. And so, you know, it's just, it's, I don't know where the Holy Spirit's uh, leading all this in terms of why I'm saying this, but maybe he's going to give you application for this, is that Jesus could have said, I have four brothers, <laughs> I'm going to pick one, John, go, go bring her to, to them, but he doesn't do it. He chooses 
one of his disciples with shared experiences where they had mutual um, knowledge of things and that they could bless one another. So that's the third statement from the cross. We'll get to the rest um, in, the, in the weeks to come. We may do one or two at the same, like two at the same week. We'll see how, how it goes. But um, uh, I, I've been blessed by this. There's so much here that I didn't even realize was there until I was really starting digging deep into it and seeing, man, there's a lot, there's a lot we can learn from this situation. It's amazing how God's word is, how, you know, you can go study this your whole life and never get to the end of it. It's so deep. And so often people don't value this for all that it is. There's so much there. You can read it so many times over and over and over again. You still receive, receive something different. Not just new information, but actually he speaks to you because he's, he, it's, the Holy Spirit gets behind it and your, your circumstances are different when you read at that time. And so he, he speaks to you in a different way. It's, it's amazing. God's word's amazing, isn't it? Yeah. All right, let's pray together. Thank you, Lord, for um, our example in Jesus providing for his mother, Lord. And I pray that if there's anyone here that um, you're speaking to regarding a different course of action related to their family, um, I just pray that you would solidify that in their hearts, Lord. I thank you that you can do so much with so little with your word by your spirit, Lord. And we're so grateful that you are so willing to change our situation and speak to us so that we can be better vessels for you and to be better ambassadors for you in this world. So we thank you for today. We pray that you would um, bless our time together as we uh, share a meal together and and, uh, share just the themes of you with one another, building ourselves up, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen.